Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WrestleNomics Radio. I'm Brandon Thurston, broadcasting on demand from Buffalo, New York, where last night a 75-year-old man was pushed to the ground and seriously injured by Buffalo police officers. And I'm sure many of you uh, who are listening have seen the video by now, and that, that just one video of so many uh, interactions, let's say, between protesters and law enforcement as civil unrest has swept uh, my home country in the last 10 days or so. And I don't think we can have a uh, normal WrestleNomics this week. I don't know that there's a lot of news for one thing. And I know we have a lot of listeners from all over the world, not just the United States. And I don't know what it's like to live in any other country. I've lived in the United States uh, my entire life since 1985, and I've spent very little time outside of it. But I can say living in the United States, at least to this white person who grew up in the suburbs and now lives in Buffalo, that uh, the United States has been an increasingly sad place to live, at least for the last three and a half years or so. In that time, my deep naivete and optimism that I had about people has been destroyed daily as we reveal ourselves to lack the common decency that I apparently thought we had. In the last few years, and maybe less than the last year or so, maybe I've just gotten numb, but in the last few years, my heart has been breaking daily for the people who suffer in this country and for the people, quite honestly, like so many people who I know and who are friends and family members of mine, who are content to find reasons to stand by and let those people suffer, to assert that their suffering is just. This time has been a sad awakening to the lack of empathy within some people, especially other white people. More so, but not completely, of an elder generation who continue to demonstrate an inability to appreciate the atrocities of our history and the many social problems that other people live with today that purportedly can be dismissed with homespun answers about personal failures and that purportedly can be contradicted with personal stories about emerging from poverty or other disadvantages. To still hear those arguments, to still hear so many white Americans deny the existence of so-called white privilege, to hear so many white Americans deny the existence of racial inequality is extremely sad. I think many white Americans bluntly interpret that if their lot in life was gathered through advantage, that that diminishes them, that that denies the assertion that they worked extremely hard to get what they have. It has not yet been parsed in white America that one can work extremely hard either from a position of advantage or from a position of disadvantage and still acknowledge, had they been of a race that in our country has an unfair stigma, that probably bears repeating the point. So many of my fellow white Americans think that when you tell them that they have white privilege, they think that you are telling them that they did not have to work hard for what they achieved in life. Utterly allergic to such a notion, their defense mechanism is to deny the existence of any white advantage. We in white America have not yet comprehended that no one is saying that we did not work hard to get what we have. No one is saying that we do not have what we have. No one is saying that we did not face numerous challenges and disadvantages. What's being said is that if we were not white, what we have would have been even harder to get. That has not been comprehended. That has not been admitted in white America. White Americans like myself have been allowed to believe that racism ended sometime before our lives began in the 1960s, thanks to the civil rights movement of that time. Like so many other social problems that perpetuate today, our educations allowed us to think that the stories ended at the time at which the history books were referencing. Some of us are learning now that that was not the case that the suffering of black Americans like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Samuel DeBose, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, 
Jordan Davis, is a violent microcosm of what black Americans face throughout their lives, a burden that no amount of hard work or personal disadvantage allows us to know. I fear, though, too, that there's no amount of truth or conversation that will allow some white Americans to comprehend. I don't know what acts of persuasion that haven't been tried would be successful when so many of these conversations are had under the false premise that someone else will be convinced of your side. When we are inundated with endless media options that confirm and comfort whatever is most emotionally soothing to us, when we are inundated with a media environment that has an incentive structure that rewards rage and spectacle, a media environment from wrestling media to news media that is supported by advertising revenue, which is only as valuable as the number of impressions the content is able to attract. Our ad-supported media is monetarily rewarded, not based on how true it is, not based on how well-researched it is, not based on how effectively it accurately informs its audience, but based on how much attention the piece of content is able to attract. And what better way to attract attention than to exacerbate the very extremes of human nature? What better way to attract attention than to highlight, or better yet, exaggerate, outrage, division, anger, violence, spectacle, whatever it is that attracts the most impressions to the widest audience. We pretend we are having talks about the truth. We are just having talks about winning. We've cultivated a culture that punishes people who change their minds. Debates online and in person too often resemble a game between the home team and the away team much more than they resemble any sort of intellectual effort to resolve a problem. The object to find the truth has been lost, and the object to just win remains. And bias is a problem that only other people have. At the moment I record this, there are people marching in the streets not far from where I'm sitting. And the violence that I've seen on TV and social media from scenes of protests around the country are disturbing. It is encouraging, though, to see so many people show up and show that they refuse to accept the brutality and subjugation of black Americans. It is heartening to see so many people want to do something about the problem. Because many Americans are very cynical about almost any kind of political activity. Protesting and voting, and in that cynicism, we defer what fragmented power we have to other Americans, many of whom do not look like or live like the people who suffer the most in the United States. I hope this is the beginning of the end of that time. The supposedly idyllic democracy of the United States of America, or at least the perception of it, will end not with a bang, I fear, but with the cool cynicism of being above the fray. We demand perfection of the elected, as we should, but human power inevitably corrupts, and our disengagement when that power corrupts is the thing that allows it to corrupt further. Our defense mechanism to face uncertainty, the pessimism that it's all not worth it, there's no point, is an effective emotional defense mechanism for our hearts, and it is a cynicism that evil, hatred, Racism, greed, and corruption rely on to survive. Well, that's more than enough from me. The rest of this episode will contain some audio clips from various uh, African Americans, past and present, and that'll start now. Here's Xavier Woods this week on Up, Up, Down, Down. Uh, my dad told me when I was much younger, when I was the tiny child, he told me that there's going to be people that don't like me purely because of the way that I look, purely because of the color of my skin. And unfortunately, there's not, mm -hmm. there's not always a lot that you can do 
to change someone's mind about you. So he explained that to me and I didn't really understand. I didn't get it as a kid. Um, but then throughout my life, he always made sure that I understood that I had to work uh, twice as hard as some people in order to get treated the same in a lot of situations, not even the same. Um, so when you do everything that you possibly can, um, you know, you educate yourself, you learn to be an athlete, you learn to play an instrument, you, you're in AP classes, you're doing everything that you can. And you're doing it because you want to, because you want to learn these things, you want to understand these things. But then at its core, I, I realized through a conversation the other day that because of the way things are, my entire life I've had to spend trying to figure out how to present myself as non-threatening. Mm. And if you, if you haven't been in that situation or understood something like that, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a lot because even though someone might hate me, the onus is on me to deal with it, not on them. There's no pressure on them to deal with, with their hate and their pain. While in, in my house as a child, I had to have this talk. I had to get this talk. I, my parents had to give me this information, not so that I could be smarter, not so that I could, I could do better. It's so that I could stay alive. That was the first goal in our house was survive amongst people who might not want you to survive. And the fact that I have to now turn around and give that same talk to my two sons more than two decades later, it, sh it should not be like that. When a group of people is saying, please stop killing us. If your response is anything, but yes, if it's, but well, that's the fundamental problem. And when we talked about this before we went on, I, I've been trying to figure out a way, a concise a concise way because I, I have a little bit of a following because I, I am on TV. So I'm, I'm in this position where people are, are wondering what I'm thinking. And it's taken me so long because I, I don't, I don't know what I'm thinking. I just know that I want, I want stuff. I want this all to stop. It's been happening for too long. It's not just become a problem now. It hasn't just become a problem in the last 10 years, 20 years. This has been a problem since Black people were brought to America. Everything that we have done is always just asked to not be executed. Unarmed people getting murdered in the middle of the street. People being shot 41 times by undercover police while they're just trying to get into their door. Sleeping in your bed where you're supposed to be safe. People busting in the door and shooting you, murdering you. And people seem to not care or when people hear about it and their response is, well, what were you doing to make that happen? Mm. Why is it on us? It's always on us. And I, I hate it. And I'm terrified with the coronavirus because I have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old. And now I have to also worry about the fact that the country, the society hasn't changed enough throughout the lifetime of my grandfather and my father and myself, that my kids are going to have to deal with this too. Here's James Baldwin. And let's speak plainly. We know, everybody knows, no matter what the professions of my unhappy country may be, that we are not bobbing people out of existence in the name of freedom. If it were freedom we were concerned about, then long, long ago, we would have done something about Johannesburg, South Africa. If we were concerned with freedom, boys and girls would not, as I stand here, be perishing in the streets of Harlem. We are concerned with power, nothing more than that. And most unluckily for the Western world, it has consolidated its power on the backs of people who are now going to die rather than be used any longer. In short, the economic arrangements of the Western world proved to be too expensive for most of the world. And the Western world will change these arrangements. All these arrangements will be changed for them. This is what is beneath all the rhetoric and all those rather shameful speeches coming from my president. Here's MVP this week on Chasing Glory with 
Julian Garcia. Because growing up, I remember seeing Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson and saying, man, when I grow up, I want to look like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that they were. And people, you know, the issue of race is always a sensitive one, especially in these days. But when you grow up, I'm 46, as I said. So growing Mm up, all the movies, the heroes are white. Right. All the television shows, you know, the the, the heroes are white. Mm -hmm. And. You don't have a lot of superheroes or role models that look like you. Right. And Barbies. Barbies. White. Right. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so you don't, it, it, if you're not made aware of it, it's not something that you necessarily realize. So when you do have a hero, when you do have a sports figure or an actor that you can identify with, hey, he looks like me, you know? Mm-hmm. So to see Kofi with the WWE Championship, that gave millions and millions of little kids around the world a hero who they can identify with yeah like, wow he looks like me right you know? i could be a black champion too yeah you know? and I, it's difficult for some people to digest that but for the most part it's not that hard to no. understand you know? here's tony morrison which brings me to my question to you do you still have that encounter Do you, Toni Morrison, Pulitzer Prize winner, successful, honored in the halls of academe, Mm -hmm. et cetera, still have that encounter? Yes, I do, Charlie, but let me tell you, that's the wrong question. Okay, what's the right question? How do you feel? Not you, Charlie Rose, but don't you understand that the people who do this thing, who practice racism, are bereft. There is something distorted about the psyche. It's a huge waste and it's a corruption and a distortion it's like it's a profound neurosis that nobody examines for what it is it feels crazy it is crazy and it leaves it has just as much of a deleterious effect on white people and possibly equal as it does black people i always knew that i had the moral high ground all my life I always thought those people who said I couldn't come in the drugstore and I had to sit in these funny places, I couldn't you go felt in the Martin park. Superior to them I from did. Day one. And I thought they knew that I knew that they were inferior to me morally. I always thought that. And my parents always thought that. You said your father was racist because he always felt like he was he always superior. Thought, that's right. He always felt superior. And that was a form, you know, of, of, defen- of defensive racism. But if if the racist white person, I don't mean the person who is examining his consciousness and so on, doesn't understand that he or she is also a race, it's also constructed, it's also made, and it also has some kind of serviceability. But when you take it away, I take your race away, and there you are, all strung out, and all you got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? Are you still like yourself? I mean, these are the questions. It's part of it is, yes, the victim. How terrible it has been for black yeah, people. But you don't like that. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be one. And the victim is the other person who is morally inferior and that's who what, that's a has serious to hold question. on to. Of course, racism. If you to have to hold, that's for a, his or her own self-esteem and definition. If you can only be tall, because somebody's on their knees then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem. And they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Take me out of it. Then give white people some free advice. (laughs) They're all in my books. Here's Dr. Michael Eric Dyson reading from his book, Tears We Cannot Stop. The opposition to black displays of dissent rests on a faulty premise and a confusion of terms. Many of you who oppose our dissent because of patriotism are really opposing us because of nationalism, and whether you know it or not, a white nationalism at that. There is a big difference between nationalism and patriotism. Nationalism is the uncritical celebration of one's nation, regardless of its moral or political virtue. It is summarized in the saying, my country right or wrong. Lump it or leave it. 
Nationalism is a harmful belief that can lead a country down a dangerous spiral of arrogance or off a precipice of political narcissism. Nationalism is the belief that no matter what one's country does, whether racist, homophobic, sexist, xenophobic, or the like, it must be supported and accepted entirely. Beloved, there appears in this flap to be a confusion of symbol and substance. The worship of the flag is, too, a form of nationalist idolatry. It is not respectful love. It confuses the cloth with conviction. The power doesn't reside in the flag. It resides in the ideals to which the flag points. The worship of the flag gets us nowhere, nor does enthusiastically embracing the troubled song that accompanies it. Listen to the third verse of the Star-Spangled Banner, which includes the words, No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. Whiteness was pitched into the nation's collective memory through song in the same way that it was stitched into the nation's pride through a waving banner. Most of us know nothing of our anthem's political pedigree or its racist implications. That's why American hero Jackie Robinson wrote in his autobiography, I Never Had It Made, I cannot stand and sing the anthem. I cannot salute the flag. I know that I am a black man in a white world. What can lift the stars and stripes higher are the real-life practices that can make that flag and that song meaningful. Here's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I was an immigrant. Somehow... Not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? White America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes color a stigma. America freed the slaves in 19... I mean, 1863, through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. All right. Let's go for it. Let's take Florida, for example. Yeah. My home state. Yeah. Um, they put a referendum on the ballot to restore voting rights to convicted felons. Oh, because you can't even vote? I, no, I don't have the right to vote. I lost my right to vote before I was old enough <laughs> to exercise it. What? But you pay taxes. But I pay taxes. <laughs> okay, something yeah. else I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. When you're convicted of a felony... In most places, you lose your right to vote permanently. Jesus. I mean, I could see if you this lose the right to vote for your, for your time that you served. That's, you know, I can see that, but not after well, you serve. Okay. Voter disenfranchisement. So the problem that we're dealing with is specifically in Florida. We'll show you over 60% of the population voted that once someone has served their time in prison, their right to vote should be restored. Okay. The law, as it was written on, on the books, uh, said, uh, and with law, you have to be very specific about words. So I'm paraphrasing, forgive yeah. me. But basically, when you served your sentence, you can vote. So the Republicans in Florida decided that 
serving your sentence means paying all of your fines and any restitution or anything. Not just that you get out of prison, but that you satisfied whatever other aspects of your sentence were. Okay. The reason for that The Republicans in Florida say, well, hey, this is what the law says. However, the overwhelming majority of people that would have had their rights to vote would be primarily black voters and people of a lower financial status, people who tend to overwhelmingly vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. So from a position of power. Um, it's believed that the Republicans are attempting to prevent those people from regaining their right to vote because the last several elections in Florida have been very close. Mm -hmm. If you remember George Bush and Al Gore, mm -hmm. it came down to, you know, the, the hanging yeah. chads and, you know, a few hundred votes. Right. So now you shift the balance of power in Florida. Yeah. If all of a sudden you add a million voters and say six or seven hundred thousand of those voters, would vote Democrat. Why would they vote Democrat? Why are they assuming that they would automatically oh, vote Democrat? Oh, because there's a, a, a disproportionate number of, of black people who vote Democrat. Okay. Um, and in the prison system in Florida is, uh, while black people make up less than 12% of the population, they make up over 50% of the prison population. And at that point, now we're getting into, you know, talk about, uh, systemic racism and, and, and history and economics. And there's so many different things that come into play there. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I want to be, I want to make it very clear. I think if the roles were reversed, I think that the Democrats would do the same thing. I think that it's just about power. I don't think yeah. that any particular and disclaimer, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a conservative. I like to think for myself. I don't think that any political party has a monopoly on good ideas. You know? I love that. So, um, but it would stand to reason based on the fact that in Florida, the majority of the people who would be benefiting mm -hmm. by this would most likely lean Democrat in their voting. It would behoove the Republicans to try to thwart that. Um, but again, I think if the roles were yeah, reversed yeah. and the Democrats were in a state where most of the people, if it, all things were reversed, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. what we get like, when yeah. we're dealing with politics. Yeah. If my guy does it, I'm not upset about it. If your guy does it, it, it's, it's, it's a national, yeah. it's a national issue. You know, I say all the time, you know, when Bush was president, I saw people excoriate him for certain policies. When Barack Obama came, became president and continued those same policies, the people who were Barack Obama guys didn't criticize Barack Obama, mm. Obama for carrying on those policies. Or, you know, when Barack Obama was deporting people, you know, they called him the deporter in chief. Mm. A lot of people forget that, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're a Barack Obama guy, it's cool. I am no fan of Trump. Right. But don't give Trump shit. I don't like hypocrites. Yeah, but that's all politics is, and this is yeah. what we're coming down to. Right. My issue, it's tribal. I know? was just going to say, because going into this, and not to stay on this topic, um, because I really want to get into your story more, too, is the Democrats have been in power, though, too, and they've had the majority. Why not change that law? If that's the way they were thinking, and they have well, the majority. Well, now you get into the issue of for-profit prisons government contracts where, and, and, and I know just about Florida specifically, where there are prisons that have a contract with the government to run at a 90 some odd percent occupancy rate. This is the contract that they have with the government mm -hmm. that you must keep us occupied to this percent or you're in violation of the contract. Holy So moly. the whole concept of having a for-profit prison, we're running prisons to make money, should, in my opinion, in itself be here is Nikki Giovanni. Black Lives Matter, not a hashtag. I'm not ashamed of our history because I know there is more to come. I'm not ashamed of slavery, neither bought nor sold, because I know there is another answer. I'm not ashamed of dark or light skin, straight or curly or nappy, let's call it that, hair. 
I'm not ashamed of thick or thin lips, nor the time we waste singing and dancing. We taught the white folks to sing and dance, too. I'm proud of Simon the Cyrenian. Nobody made him help Jesus. He did his part. I'm proud of the woman who moaned on the ship at the tenth day for admitting, if not defeat, then certainly change. I'm proud of the rappers who rap, and most especially, I'm proud that Black Lives Matter. We do. We honestly do. Here's Malcolm X. In order for you and me to devise some kind of method or strategy to offset some of the events or re a repetition of the events that have taken place here in Los Angeles recently, we have to go to the root. We have to go to the cause. Dealing with the condition itself is not enough. And it is because of our effort toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation away from us or aside from us is come together against the common enemy. <laughs> Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? And I, for one, as a Muslim, believe that the white man is intelligent enough. If he were made to realize how black people really feel and how fed up we are without that old compromising sweet talk. Stop sweet talking him. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how what kind of hell you've been catching and let him know that if he's not ready to clean his house up, if he's not ready, to clean his house up. He shouldn't have a house. It should catch on fire and burn down. I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means that you have agreed that human life is an academic matter. So I'm forced to be an optimist. I'm forced to believe that we can survive whatever we must survive. But The Negro in this country, the future of the Negro in this country is precisely as bright or as dark as the future of the country. It is entirely up to the American people and our representatives, it is entirely up to the American people whether or not they are going to face and deal with and embrace this stranger and they malign so long. What white people have to do is try to find out in their own hearts why it was necessary to have a nigger in the first place. Because I'm not a nigger. I'm a man. But if you think I'm a nigger, it means you need it. And the question you've got to ask yourself, the white population of this country has got to ask itself, north and south, because it's one country, and for a negro, there is no difference in the north and the south. There's just you know, a difference in the way they, in a way they castrate you. But, that's, but the fact of the castration is the American fact. If I'm not the nigger here, and the, you invented him, you, the white people, invented him, then you've got to find out why. 